afternoon, everybody. Thanks for coming, and even if you, and especially Roseanne, who came, got here through two feet of snow. <laughs> Just been fantastic, and we appreciate it so, so much. My pleasure. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, our, let me introduce our speaker today, and I think, uh, I actually just let me say, our speaker today is a really nice, ma nice man. I, I really have, in, have enjoyed my time uh, that I have known Nathan for the last couple few few years, uh, and I think you're going to you're going to enjoy him too. Nathan Sanders is the uh, associate director for special collections at the um, UNCW, uh, I can't think of the name of the library. At, at the Randall, uh, Randall Library. Thank you very much, Nathan. That's okay. Randall, Randall Library. And Nathan is going to talk to us about uh, the special, special collections, uh, where rare, rare books, and uh, you're going to see record, recordings that he's going to use in his presentation, and actually some uh, quite a bit of material about Southport uh, as well. And the Historical Society and the working with Nathan has started to add to those, to those materials about Southport that the uh, Randall Library will take care of in their special collections. So let me introduce uh, Dr. Sanders. Thank you very much, Bob. And I must say, I really enjoy getting to know Bob as well. And I was at one of your meetings, I believe it was Christmas, 2017, I think, uh, when Bob did a, a wonderful reenactment of General Benjamin Smith. So um, that was a that was a fun introduction to your society, and it was great to see such an active society with people who were very interested in the history of Southport, either their home or their adoptive home, and uh, just very encouraging to me. I I'd moved here in 2017 from South Carolina, so getting to know sort of the landscape of cultural heritage institutions has been one of my things I've tasked myself with. And Southport is so active and so interested. And so I'm gonna start sharing my screen here because uh, I have a pre presentation about what we have at Randall Library that can inform the study of Southport. Um, let's see here. Uh, all right. And I've checked all the boxes I'm supposed to, I'm supposed to check. I am uh, hopefully going to have no trouble with any AV materials I use in this, uh, in this presentation. Uh, but I'm gonna go ahead and just dive in. And, and Bob mentioned my title as being the um, Associate Director for Library Specialized Collections. Just this past week, we actually changed our name of our department uh, because we discovered that the name Library Specialized Collections was not very evocative of much of anything. Um, and so we, we collect Southeast North Carolina. Uh, we, as I talk about that in a minute, we you know the counties that we collect and, and things like that. So we wanted to make sure that people knew what kind of uh, library we are, what kind of archive we are. And, we're, and so we changed our name to the Center for Southeast North Carolina Archives and History, because we believe that this will better position us in the communities that we serve um, to take an active role in helping them with their historic preservation needs in terms of manuscripts and photographs and videos and things like that. Um, but so this is actually the first presentation I've done as the director for the Center of Southeast, for Southeast North Carolina Archives and History. So I'm very excited about that. Um, so who are we? Just a quick introduction. And if there's a problem, please put something in the chat because with my view sharing my screen, I can pretty much um, see my screen and can't necessarily see anybody else at this moment. Uh, but who we are, uh, we are government information, we are university archives, and we are special collections. That's what makes up the Center for Southeast North Carolina Archives and History. Um, some of you may not know that the way that the government uh, publishing program works is libraries have a choice to participate in the government publishing program, which means that we get government documents for free. And these documents can range from anything from census reports to the transcripts for hearings of, for, from Congress to decisions of the National Labor Relations Board. It can run the gamut of anything that you can imagine that the federal government publishes. And so we have participated in that program for over 50 years now. And we're actually the only library in our congressional district, in the seventh congressional district, that um, participates in the government program to get free government publications. 
We also get state publications. So things published by the state of North Carolina, same types of things. Uh, things published by state agencies or things published by, um, published as part of, uh, for example, the general assembly hearings or debates. Those things you can come to Randall Library and see. Um, and, and we are actually what is called a primary repository for state publications, which means we should get pretty much everything they publish in one form or another. We also include university archives. Uh, that's the records of the university. And, and I always like that to point out, UNCW is really unique in that our university archives um, hold a lot of local history because of the nature of this school. Um, the trustees were drawn from the local area for many, many years and uh, exclusively from the local area. So a lot, a lot of local history is bound up in our own university records. And then finally, where I'm gonna to focus today is special collections. And so we, those, those are the three parts of the Center for Southeast North Carolina Archives and History. Special collections really focuses on these eight counties and Sampson County's name got cut off there. But uh, you see, we focus on collecting material from New Hanover, Brunswick, Columbus, Bladen, Sampson, Duplin, Pender and Onslow counties. Um, that's sort of, those sort of the eight counties that classically the university has seen itself as serving. Um, and so we want to do our best to make sure that manuscript material, historical photographs, maps, books about these areas, all of these things that we, uh, that are published about and come from these areas, we, um, we can collect. And as Bob mentioned, uh, we've sort of developed this a special relationship with the Southport Historical Society that I'll talk about in a moment. Um, special collections archives often become notorious for just collecting everything that, um, that, come, that comes to them. And the problem with that is that you often end up taking things that take up a lot of your time and energy, but are not necessarily of high research value or don't have any connection to the area that you're trying to serve. And so we've really begun uh, over the past four or five years to focus in on these, area, these counties, this area, to make sure... There's more than enough here, by the way, to collect. It is uh, a very rich area, historically speaking. Um, on, and so we really want to make sure that we, we focus on this area. So that's our focus for special collections. Um, just a quick rundown of, of some things that might be of interest that I'll talk about today. There are some collections that we have long held that I think are really relevant to the study of Southeast North Carolina and in particular, Southport. So for example, we have the papers of former United States Congressman. Alton Lennon was in Congress from 1957 until 1973. I'm sure those years mean, uh, mean a lot to you because uh, there was so much major legislation passed during that time, not just great society legislation from Lyndon Johnson, but also civil rights legislation. So Alton Lennon was in Congress, for example, for the Civil Rights Act of 1964, for the Voting Rights Act of 65, for the Civil Rights Act of 68. There are so many things that he saw during his time in Congress that make his collection extremely valuable. Uh, Mike McIntyre, who um, was in Congress from 97 until 2015, also has a very rich collection. He represented our, our area as well. And then we have papers of organizations like the North Carolina Coastal Federation. Um, and so you can see uh, that really where we focus is on post-World War II history. Um, and that's not necessarily because we um, are not interested in 19th century history. It's just by the nature of historical accident. So this university was founded in 1947. And um, by that time, uh, a lot of the historical documents related from the 19th century related to our area had already made their way up to Chapel Hill or Duke. And so by the time UNCW gets to a position in which it can start collecting historical materials, um, it ended up focusing on more recent history. And I think that's a great thing because I like to think of my job as doing what we can to collect for historians 50 to 100 years from now. Um, historians I may never meet or researchers or local genealogists that I may never meet, but we're going to have an archive that really speaks to their needs. And so I, I, I don't think that um, anybody can really study our region after World War II without coming uh, to look at some of the materials that we have. Um, it, in particular, uh, as I mentioned in a, in, a, in a second, we picked up recently League of Women Voters, the Lower Cape Fear, those records, um, WWAY News Archive, the Columbus News Reporter Photo Archive. Um, there are just so many great collections that we have that I feel like really inform the study of the history of our region since World War II. And so that's where we've ended up focusing a lot of our energy. Um, we can go to Chapel Hill and Duke and access the older materials, 
but our real bread and butter are, is post-World War II Southeast North Carolina history. Um, and we have a lot of Southport specific collections uh, that I think you would get a kick out of if you were able to come to, to see them at any time. So for example, we have the collect, a collection from the North Carolina 4th of July Festival. That um, group um, has given their records, um, they're, they're technically on loan to us, but those records and those papers are here with us. And this is the cover of a booklet from the 1969 uh, festival. And we've got these for, for almost all the years, but for many, many years since 1969 uh, that uh, anybody can come see and research. So when we think of Southport, many people around the state think of this 4th of July festival. That's what they think of when they think of Southport. And so we really are, are honored to have that collection here with us. Um, we also have a great collection uh, from Military Ocean Terminal Sunny Point. Um, there's some Fort Johnson material in that collection, but a lot of it has to do with uh, the, the terminal there. And this is a public document, so I don't think I'm necessarily sharing anything um, out of the ordinary. But in April, you know, they, there are also incident logs there. So in April 1998, there was um, uh, a list of accidents that had it that included some Soviet mines and mine fuses. So I'm really glad that they got that taken care of and didn't have a problem at Military Ocean Terminal Sunny Point. But that's, again, a great collection that we have that I'm sure many people in the area would be interested in. And then Bob mentioned our partnership uh, a little earlier. Um, one of the things that we at UNCW want to do is make sure that we are a resource to groups like the Southport Historical Society um, who have collected things over the years and who have research collections, but who um, may not have the staff or the time to, to care for those things. Um, so one of the things that Bob and, and I have done over the years is, is attempted to start up a, a process that has been interrupted by hurricanes and, um, and COVID, unfortunately, uh, but start up a process whereby um, we can make things digitally available or Bob himself can scan some things and then the materials can come here, the original materials can come here for safekeeping in our climate controlled storage on our shelving uh, where we have staff who can make these collections available to researchers uh, and students in particular. We have lots of students, probably over 400 students each semester under normal times coming to South, special collections to use our materials. And so we're excited to have the originals here because they get to learn about how to use an archive. They get to learn about what it means to come to a special collections unit. Um, Bob himself has made some digital collections available to us that we have put on our homepage, our digital collections page. Um, so some of these uh, letters that have been scanned by the society over the years, we've been added as well. And I think we're going to add some more later. Um, I, I mentioned COVID. We've, our digital in initiatives program, for example, has been sort of uh, slowed down dramatically by COVID unfortunately, but we're going to get back on track. So we're really grateful for this partnership with the Southport Historical Society, where we can um, do what we can to help the society preserve history and make research of materials available for anybody interested in Southport. So that is just a quick rundown of what we might have that could relate very clearly uh, to interest in Southport, the North Carolina Fourth of July Festival, Sunny Point, these collections here, like the Woodbine Garden Club, the Margaret T. Harper collection is really a collection focused on the old community building in Southport. We have uh, this, this community activist group, No Port Southport, which is a great name, and then the digital collections we have here. Um, so just a, quick, just a quick few highlights of things you might find in the collections that we have. I mentioned Alton Lennon earlier, and the great thing about congressional collections is that everything everything flows to congressmen. Um, every issue, every um, local concern all, makes its way into a congressperson's office. So a congressman like Lennon is going, to, is going to interact, especially back then, very closely with municipal leaders. And so this is a letter between Lennon and the city manager at that time, Mr. C.D. Pickerell, about a federal grant program uh, that would help expand sewer service in Southport. And the city manager is very interested in this program. Uh, it looks like, according to all the correspondence we have, that he was not able to get Southport to participate in the program. But it was just a really nice snapshot of how very local concerns make their way all the way to Congress. And you have someone like Alton Lennon responding to it. And when you get into these collections, uh, you start to see that there are issues like the, the Fourth of July Festival, like 
um, local sewer service, like civil rights or education, all of them contained in this one collection. And so we have lots of collections that seem very um, obvious when it comes to studying Southport history, but then we've got these regional collections. Um, and again, that's where I'm gonna spend most of my time today that um, really highlight Southport history in a special way um, that we may not think about as necessarily being Southport focused, but there's so much in there of local concern. Uh, this is a letter uh, from a constituent written in 1970 to Alton Lennon. It's a constituent in Tabor City, but he's actually very concerned about the um, coming nuclear plant in South Fork. And in that third major paragraph down, it says, in the case of possible thermal pollution from the nuclear power plant in South Fork, the Carolina Power and Light Company has advised that there will be only a slight increase in water temperature. So Lennon is sort of putting this constituent's fears to rest about potential problems with the nuclear plant in South Ford. Um, again, these congressional collections um, are so rich. And so I could actually pull out probably uh, 10 different towns in Southeast North Carolina and pull together hundreds of letters related to local concerns in that town. So even though Alton Lennon, you don't necessarily think he, he's a South Fort guy or he's got a lot of South Fort issues he's thinking about, um, his collection is really valuable in that way. Um, another one, like the North Carolina Coastal Federation, again, it's not necessarily based in South Fort. It's not something that uh, you necessarily comes to mind when you think of South Fort. But when you go to that collection, you find letters like this. There's, there was a real concern, for example, over the Walmart just outside of town, or may actually be in town now. I'm not sure the annexation, uh, how that has happened. But they were very concerned about the Walmart and water, stormwater pollution uh, related to uh, construction of the Walmart. So this is an example, again, of a collection that doesn't necessarily spring to mind when you think of South Fort issues. But there's a lot of South Fort in there. So I'm going to turn uh, my attention again to uh, some modern collections, uh, particularly WWAY. Um, one of the things that historians talk a lot about when they talk about Southern history is they talk about the New South. Uh, there is a um, an idea that you've got the Old South is very rural, and then you've got the New South that is built on industry. And a lot of times when people talk about the New South, uh, they talk about places like Birmingham or Atlanta or Greenville Spartanburg, where I'm from. Um, and they talk about heavy industry, manufacturing. The, um, they may even talk about tech industries, Charlotte or the Triangle. And they talk about how that's the New South. But I think in that discussion, a lot of time, what, times what gets bypassed is the part of the South that is in some ways highly suburban and is really built on things other than heavy industry. And so I feel like the new South we think of, when we think of South Fort or Wilmington or Southeast North Carolina in general, is a new South that is built on things other than heavy manufacturing, things like tourism, leisure and cultural heritage, um, things like nuclear energy and environmental concerns or even environmental ecotourism is, is a phrase that's often used or even the military and shipping. Military can be, as many of you know, a driving factor in an area's economy, um, as can international shipping. And so when you start to look at the quote unquote New South, or you start to look at Southern, modern Southern history in those terms, you start to move away from places like Atlanta or Charlotte or Greenville Spartanburg. And you start to looking, you start looking at places like Southport and you realize um, so much of the development of this region is driven by these things. And in many ways, Southport starts to look more like a Charleston, South Carolina or Northport, Virginia or Savannah, Georgia, um, when you start thinking about what makes the modern South. Um, and it's amazing to see when you start looking at our sources in Alton Lennon or you start looking at our sources in the Coastal Federation and particularly in WWAY, um, how all of these issues come to the fore. So for example, um, just real quick, when, when looking at WWAY, I want to take a quick note and talk about video preservation. Um, Audiovisual preservation is one of those things that is really expensive and really hard to do. And as a result, archivists have not done a lot of it. Um, and so we got a call about three years ago to come pick up the WWAY news archive. They were moving out to Leland. And um, as a result, they were thinking of throwing away all of their news tapes going back to about 1982. And fortunately, they did not do that. There was one guy at the station, a guy named Kevin Wazardo, who called us and he said, can you come get this? And we were very excited. And um, once we got the tapes, we started working on grants to get them digitized. Unfortunately, we got a grant, we we're able to get it digitized. And 
one of the things that, uh, that we're excited about, one of the reasons we're excited about it is because these tapes contain this amazing chronicle of local history going back to about 40 years. Um, it is an uh, absolutely stunning visual chronicle of what it was like to be in Southeast North Carolina for all this time. There are problems associated with it. That's why we had to get it digitized. It's on magnetic media, which hates humidity and heat. And um, you can imagine this is the exact wrong place to have magnetic media stored. They had it stored in an, uh, like an attic area with a tin roof. So we're, it's a minor miracle that it even survived. Um, so it's on magnetic media, which is a problem. Usually you can only get one play from these out of, um, uh, out of old tapes uh, before you can't ever play it again. Uh, on top of that, you have to find a tape player. This is a format called a Umatic tape. And Umatic tapes um, were widely used in broadcast really up until the late 1990s, but it's really hard to find a Umatic tape player and it's even harder to find somebody who can fix them. Um, and then finally, there's what we call limited metadata. So when I have a letter like the Alton Lennon letters in front of me, I can pull out all sorts of information to put it in an online catalog so someone can then do a keyword search and find that. With this, all the metadata I have for 1,400 tapes, each tape has a label like this and, written, and is written on it what was on that tape. Um, so that's all the metadata I have. And as you can tell, um, it may not be good metadata because oftentimes I can't read the handwriting of the person who made the tape. So for all of these reasons, we had to get this thing digitized. So we sent these 1,400 tapes all to a vendor who was able to do a digitization, to do digitization work on them. And we ended up with some really great uh, footage from those tapes I'm gonna share with you in just a moment. But before I do, are there any questions that anybody has? And again, when I'm sharing, I can't necessarily see everybody. So you might have to put it in chat or a bot or somebody can uh, shout out and let me know. All right. So I want us to keep in mind the, um, the things I talked about earlier, about the military or about the um, nuclear energy or about tourism, cultural heritage um, issues. And I wanted to show you some videos from WWAY to see how all those themes show up in a very modern collection like this. And hopefully you'll get a kick out of some of the things that you see. And so again, just looking for history and cultural heritage tourism, nuclear energy, military, and also growing pains, how Southport changed over the years and some of the issues and pains that that caused. Um, so this is an, a video. Um, most of the sound in these videos is really good. This one's a little quiet. So you might have to listen closely, but this is a video from June 22nd of 1983, and um, hopefully you'll, you'll see some fun footage. And again, keep those themes in mind that we talked about earlier. Most of the time, the city of Southport is a quiet... It gets louder in just a moment. But for hundreds of years, the scenic spot of the mouth of the Cape Fear River springs to life on or about the 4th of July. The annual festival is this town's trademark, the biggest event of the year. The three-day event has a historic tradition. There have been July celebrations in Southport ever since 1775, a year before the signing of the Declaration of Independence, when patriots forced the last British royal governor of North Carolina to evacuate Fort Johnston. The revolutionary protesters ignited the fort's munitions dump, hence the Southport Fourth of July fireworks tradition. At any rate, organizers are getting ready for this year's event. Well, we feel that we have a patriotic duty, more or less, to put the festival on down here to celebrate patriotism, to uh, show people that we care about this country and care about the military. So this year, from Saturday, July 2nd until Monday, July 4th, you can look forward to a festival that will include a pageant for young women, a rodeo, a carnival, a sailing regatta, a fireman's competition, an arts and crafts fair, a free beach music concert, children's field events, a revolutionary war reenactment, and of course, another big parade. Jeff White, Eyewitness News 3, Southport. Anybody see anything that you recognize there? Uh, any people you may have recognized? Um, I always enjoy looking back at, back at these. Um, so there you sort of had the first one. Let me see. All right, so there you sort of have the, the first idea of cultural heritage 
uh, tourism um, with the North Carolina Fourth of July Festival. And those of you in the Historical Society may really get a, get a kick out of this one as well. Um, and, the, and the historical tour is a Southport from 1983. If you get on board this electric cart near the downtown waterfront park, you learn practically everything you want to know about Southport, the historic little town near the mouth of the Cape Fear River at the southeastern tip of Brunswick County. Tour guide Elizabeth Watkins is full of information about the town where she was born. My grandfather built a hotel on this corner, and my mother and father leased it after he retired. The waterfront, as I knew it as a child, is much different than it is today. The whole waterfront here was full of docks, shrimp houses. If you want a vignette about people, folklore, or homes of Southport, Ms. Watkins fills you in. The house was built in 1868 and is the last house in Southport with the widow's walk on top. The house is the original 1868 house. It's never been changed anyway. Of course, the brickwork is new. And Southport has attracted artists and authors through the years. This is where author Robert Bork spent many summers. The shutters in the house to the right are the original shutters that were in the house. And the lady of the house said she has calls about Robert Ruark's works. And uh, she's real up to date on it. She really gives a good history on it. And his books, which were out of print, are now back in print. And someone said they were in the 14th printing. He also, uh, one of his most famous works was The Old Man and the Boy, and wrote of his childhood in Southport. The tour of historic Southport is sponsored by the town's Merchants Association. And merchants say it has proven to be an effective attraction for tourists as well as local residents. All right. So, again, you sort of see this, this fun look back into Southport history. Um, and how, you know, we, you can still, you know, take little tours like that today. There's one coming up later I think Bob will really like um, because you, it gets up into the 90s and, 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 it, and it starts talking to some folks that um, might start looking really familiar. Um, so you see, again, this cultural heritage tourism side of things. You see this uh, Fourth of July festival and then you see this tours in Southport. I'll start sharing uh, my screen again and start looking at some other issues. Oh, let's go to the next one, here we go. And you start to see here um, that in the midst of Southport's popularity growing, even as a vacation spot and a residential spot, there are some other problems it has to deal with. In 1965, this 300,000 gallon a day treatment plant was more than adequate to serve this small coastal town. By 1980, this plant had already reached its capacity, so the state imposed a moratorium on all development in the town. With pressure from developers and new residents mounting, the town was able to get the building ban lifted two years later, but with a condition. Is that you have to complete your design for your wastewater treatment additions and you have a time limitation on when the plant additions must be completed. In this case, it's 1987. Yeah. Smith says they already have most of the money they need. Residence in November, Southport voters approved a $985,000 sewer bond issue. He says they've received another 200000 from the and state, the and the rest will come the from the federal government. Hospital. When complete, Smith says the plant's capacity will be more than doubled. For now, they just hope that will meet their needs. In the future, we would possibly look into other type of growth from industry right. and that type of thing. But first, we're trying to take care of the needed uh, residential growth. Tim Cridland, Eyewitness News 3. All right, so again, um, a lot of historical issues we may not think about, but are still very important to the growth of a town. Um, and I believe this one is about annexation. Nina Jackson has lived on Jabbertown Road in Brunswick County for 54 years. She's on a fixed income and can barely pay her bills. Now the city of Southport wants to annex Jackson and 450 of her neighbors. The area under consideration is 445 acres northwest of Southport. For Lena Jackson and others, it will cost over $1,500 each just to hook up to water and sewer lines if their property is annexed. I don't know how in the world I would make it. I have to often just buy my house and move out. And rent, hell, I'll use that, and then I'll be in the street. 
Recently, residents here organized to fight the annexation. James Johnson has circulated a petition which he sent to his state representative. He says the city is forcing them to pay for annexation so it can incorporate the property of this future company, Cogentrix, into Southport. $48 million worth of property is going to be annexed, and it's estimated that $30 million of that is Cogentrix. The city officials say annexation is needed. Extending the city limits would generate $250,000 in property taxes, $190,000 tax dollars coming from Cogentrix and the industrial area. The area just outside the city limits already has some city services like fire and police protection. And city officials say it's time they started paying for them. As for residents like Lena Jackson, who can't afford the hookup fees, the city will help finance the cost. The, as far as the uh, assessments on like the sewer services, they do have a payback period of up to 10 years on that. Tonight, at a public hearing, city officials will present the details of the proposal to residents who say they'll turn out in full force to protest the annexation. <laughs> Kelly McNeil, Eyewitness News 3 in Brunswick County. All right. So again, the more things change, the more they stay the same in some cases. Um, here's another video. Oh, is this the same one? I'll go to the next one. That some of you may get a kick out of um, because it sort of symbolically marks the beginning of sort of, of, of a new population boom in South Ford. Nearly two and a half million Americans retire each year and about 250,000 of them leave home to do it. Because of the recent publicity, many of those could be coming to Southport. The small community of 3,000 has been ranked by Rand McNally as the 19th best place to retire right before another North Carolina city, Asheville, which ranked 21. The Murray, Kentucky Lake region captured the number one spot. Authors considered money matters, climate, safety, services, housing, and leisure in the rating of 131 popular retirement spots. So what does Southport have to offer potential retirees? Well, first of all, it's got a great climate, saltwater fishing, low-cost housing, a low crime rate, and excellent medical services. Chamber officials are obviously very happy about the rating. Retirees are great citizens. Uh, they have a lot to contribute. Uh, they're excellent citizens, and uh, they're very good volunteers, and it's just real good for the community. Plus, when they sell their homes generally, they have quite a bit of money they bring along with them as well, too, which helps our local economy out. It's as close to heaven as you'll ever find. But how do the younger folks in Southport uh, feel about the town as a retirement community? It. It's good for businesses, you know, mm -hmm. especially where I work. I work over at Southport Marina. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of elderly people coming in on, you know, from the north going to the south. But, uh, like I said, for young people, it's dead. <laughs> Nevertheless, the push is on to lure more retirees into Southport. The town has been actively advertising in magazines nationwide. Sue Tripathi, Eyewitness News 3 in Southport. So you hear that? Retirees are excellent citizens. And he was also very excited about the money that people spent, that retirees spent. So um, I'll just share a couple more, if that's okay with y'all, um, about some of the other issues that, that tend, to, tend to pop up. Um, let's see here. Let's see, move on from that. Let's see which one this is real quick. If the annexation plan is approved, Southport City... So that's more annexation. And this gets to another issue that we mentioned, nuclear energy. If the annexation plan... Sorry. Actually, I'm going to go to this one because I think you might actually see some folks you, you recognize here and there. Southport started in 1786 as the town of Smithville when a Wilmington lawyer and surveyor named Joshua Potts got sick and took a friend's advice to come here. He had a friend in Wilmington named Captain John Brown who was packet of a little boat that plied between Wilmington and Fort Johnston and Charleston. So he asked uh, 
Joshua Potts to come down to Fort Johnston with him. He thought the sea air would do him good, the salubrious breezes, as he called it. Well, the sea air worked. Potts was cured and decided he wanted to come back to build a town around Fort Johnston, the old British Army fort, which still stands today and is the oldest fort in the state still in use. By 1887, the town's name changed to Southport because its population grew to about 15,000, and its founders hoped it would become a major port and railroad system. Wanted to build a railroad that would come here and uh, it would become a coaling station and was to be, they hoped that it would rival Norfolk and Charleston as the, as the port of the South. That didn't work, and soon Southport became a tourist town with a lot of Wilmington residents buying their second or vacation homes here. Southport is still known for its tourism and history. Places to visit include Fort Johnston, the Maritime Museum, and the waterfront, where the most recent addition is this marker dedicated to the men killed on board the John D. Gill when it was torpedoed during World War II. All right. So we'll, we'll come back to that one in a second. I do want to close out with one more that, that I think also sort of gets at, I think, a, a lot of what I've been trying to, to talk about, which is this um, modern development of cultural heritage tourism, but also heavy industry and, um, and some other like military nuclear developments in the area. So I think this will be the, be the last one. I actually remember this. I was old enough to remember this controversy um, re regarding spent nuclear fuel rods. Um, when I was in South Carolina, I actually got to know um, the person in South Carolina who was trying to um, make sure that these got offloaded in at Military Ocean Terminal Sunny Point as opposed to South Carolina. Uh, he was a nice guy, but he was a villain in, in this area, at least. This morning, lawyers from South Carolina filed another appeal asking all of the federal appeals judges to rule on whether spent nuclear fuel should be allowed into the United States. But even those lawyers acknowledge the fact that the two ships already on their way will probably dock, unload, and head home before their court battle continues. The plan is to bring the nuclear fuel rods into Sunny Point Military Ocean Terminal in Brunswick County and take them by rail to Savannah River site in South Carolina for storage. Brunswick County Emergency Manager Cecil Logan says that all of the courtroom delays have helped them squeeze an extra radio oh. ocean right, an extra radiological response training. And that's what we were wanting, just a refresher course for some of our volunteers. And once again, that it, by, by it being delayed a little bit, give us that extra little bit of time to get that train in place before the first shipment would come in. Logan says that the ships carrying the rods didn't arrive Monday, and the ships weren't supposed to unload at night or over any weekend. Logan says he does have crews on standby to deal with any problems that might arise. If anything would occur, of course, we're going to take and respond. If there's any type of accident, then we will take and go as far as we can. We'll locate it, we'll back off, and we'll contact DOE and let them take it from there. People who live near Sunny Point have mixed opinions about shipping nuclear waste through Brunswick County. I don't think that they would bring it into Sunny Point if it wasn't really all that safe. My gracious, we've got the nuclear plant right down here, so that's a little bit more. I'm against it. Because you never know what could happen with that stuff. I want to make sure that it is safe. So I still had questions. So what do you think they ought to do with them? <laughs> Leave them where they're at and let them get rid of them. All right. So again, it's, it's interesting to see how in this one archive, um, all these different themes, sort of New South themes, as I call them, history and cultural heritage, nuclear energy, military, and then the growing pains that come with, with uh, migration uh, from uh, a Northern states South and the need to expand things like sewer lines and to annex areas, all of those things are contained in this one collection that again, you may not think of as a Southport collection, uh, but it is so valuable, I think, to the study of Southport, just like Alton Lennon or the Coastal Federation or the papers of Mike McIntyre. Um, so if you have any questions, you wanna come visit us or see what we have, or, or just have a research question, feel free to email me. Um, our website is listed here. 
um, as well as our digital collections page where you can see some of those items that Bob had scanned, uh, some new, scan new projects we have, um, scanning some more papers from Alton Lennon and Mike McIntyre, um, as well as some, uh, some future collections from local civil rights activists we'll hope to have up. And eventually uh, this entire WWAY collection, which is 53,000 clips, you'll be able to, to see online. Um, so I wanna thank you very much for having me here today. Uh, I wanna thank you for allowing me to talk to you about our resources and share some of the great things we, we have going on at UNCW's Randall Library. And I'll take any questions you have. Nathan, can you access um, everything from the internet? Do you have to go to the university? You can, you can access some things that we have scanned. Um, you can also access what we call our finding aids. So if you need to, if you have a question about something, you want to see if we have something, you can look at the finding aids, see if we have it, and then contact us and say, can you send me a scan of this? During COVID, we are closed to everybody but students, faculty, and staff, and hopefully that will change in May. Um, but we are always available to help remotely if you can't make it to the library, if you see something in our finding aids. If so, if you go to our website, you can look at our finding aids. If you see something and you think, I'd really like to see what that is, we can scan it and send it to you. We're in the process of getting as much up as we can online, but it's a, it's a slow process um, to get all the metadata in there properly so that when people start typing in search terms, they can get what they need. Can you give us that website again, please? Yeah, let me... Let me share the screen again and go back. Um, so our website for our department is right there and I can send Bob the PowerPoint. I might have to take out the video so it'll be small enough to send, but it's just library.uncw.edu slash archives underscore special. It says archives and special. Thank products. you. Yeah, and then our digital collections is digitalcollections.uncw.edu. Bob or Liz, could you uh, just put those websites and are those uh, addresses on our Facebook page for us or somehow make that more accessible? Sure can. Okay. We can together with Nathan, we'll, we'll get that done. Uh, I want to thank, thank Nathan for uh, featuring the co-founder of the <clears throat> Southport Historical Society in the, in the video, video. Yeah. Very nice job, David. Yeah, no, that, that, that was a nice find. It was wonderful to see our Susie Carson again. <laughs> Sitting right there at the Whitler's bench talking about yes, the yeah. founding of the town. We uh, still miss nice her, find. yeah, very much. <laughs> no, that was a nice find. Um, and there were a few other clips, not of her, but, but a few other clips talking about, um, you know, the, the parade or are talking about historical tours and things like that. Um, I love my job. I get to get to look at old videos uh, all day, not just in Southport, but all over. It's um, it's quite a treat. This collection in particular is somewhat unique in that um, it will be the only one fully digitally available for any collect for any station, I think, in the Carolinas um, once it's up. Uh, so. There are also sorts of rights issues that many stations have to work out. For example, WRAL still, Capital Broadcasting still owns those rights. So it's up to them as to whether or not they want to get that up. But we, we're looking forward to the day of getting that up as well. We've also got a few other scanning projects going on. We've um, tried to get scanned and have gotten scanned um, a number of our local newspapers that are weeklies. Um, and hopefully can get that up on our website soon. So we've got these things scanned, but it takes a while to process the, vid, the, the data files and the, um, the text files to make sure that they, everything works well. Um, so the, uh, some of the, the state port pilot is up on like Digital NC, but we've got some older, I think, issues of the state port pilot from the 40s and 50s we're gonna try to get up. And um, other things like Columbus News Reporter or the Brunswick Beacon that might have some news that's relevant to the region as well. So we're, we're, we're digitizing as quickly as we can in these times, so. Good. Uh, anything else for, for Nathan? Thanks. Right. I think, Ellie, I think Ellie's yeah. trying to talk. Oh. Very nice job, Nathan. Thank you very much. Yes. All right, anytime.
Thank you. This was really wonderful. I'm I'm very excited to dig into those your your resources. <laughs> yeah, anytime. Like I said, Alton Lennon and Mike McIntyre are readily available. And if you need film clips, don't hesitate to reach out. I can probably find them. Uh, but we, our goal is to get all 53,000 of those up by 2023. Um, so we'll see about that. But Mike McIntyre, Alton Lennon, the Coastal Federation, all those things are readily available in paper format and manuscripts. And um, we can get you scans uh, if you find something that you need. Great. Nathan, please send me an email with those uh, web addresses. Absolutely. Okay. Thanks for having me, and I'm, I'll come back anytime. Have a good one. When are you, when are you moving to Southport? <laughs> oh, we talked about it. We talked about it. There was the one thing, the one thing that the person said in the video about retirees moving south was that it was affordable housing, and it may have been <laughs> in 1987, <laughs> but um, it's it's inflation has has uh, has occurred. So, <laughs> all right. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Bob, do you want to mention what's coming up next week? Before people coming back everybody? next week, actually, actually, I think I have it here. Coming next week is Monday, February fifteenth, at seven thirty. So, excuse me, seven o'clock p.m. Uh, Mike Royal. I don't know what exactly what he's talking about this week, but he'll he'll share a story with you. Of, uh, with us, with growing up in, in Southport. And uh, maybe some of his, his friends will, uh, will pitch in as well. So that's on Monday the 15th at seven, seven o'clock. Um, if you wanna participate by Zoom, uh, we'll watch for that link or send us an email, we'll send you the link. And then on the 16th, our own Liz Fuller, uh, We'll be doing an armchair history program, the 16th at 1 p.m. Southport and the historic black colleges and, and universities. You wanna say a little bit about that, Liz? It's gonna be a really interesting um, presentation. We'll talk about how the, the schools all started after the Civil War, which is a fascinating story in its own right. And then I'm gonna be talking about some people from Southport who grew up here, who then went on and went to some of those colleges starting back in the um, 1900, maybe late 1800s on up. So it's um, it's a really interesting you know, view on um, some people that you might not know or some names that might be familiar. So I hope you guys can join me for that. Then near the end, end of the month, actually it's a, a, a program that's going to be in two two parts, if, if you will. And that's the ninth annual Brunswick County Black History Sym Symposium. And on the 19th at 6 p.m., and this will be also on Zoom, Ms. Carol, Carolyn Evans will be portraying Marianne uh, Cord. And <clears throat> Ann Cord was a woman who lost her entire family and then by a stroke of, of, of luck was reunited with, with her family 13, 13 years, years later. Um, her, her youngest son was serving in the Union Army at, at, at that time. So that's on the 19th. Then um, a, week, a week later on February 26th at 6 p.m., the program, again, part of the Black History Symposium will be Southport and the Chitlin uh, circuit. And then on the 27th at 4 p.m., Southport and the greatest gener generation from Brunswick County Training, Training School. And then on the 28th at 3 p.m., um, the finale will be the Gospel Fest, which they have, have every, every year. Um, and you, got, you have to put all of these on your calendar, but put two stars behind the Gospel Fest because it, it, is, it is a fantastic event. You want to add anything to that, Liz? Um, a caveat to the Gospel Fest is that it's just going to be everything Zoom this year, so we're making it up as we go along. It's going to be a little bit different than before. I was in a uh, rehearsal last week for the um, for Miss Carolyn Evans and part of the Chitlin Circuit thing, and I'm really excited. I think it's going to be really good. 
She's, if any of you saw her, uh, she was here a couple years ago portraying um, Harriet Tubman. So she's a, a really good actress. And that story was one that was written up by Mark Twain about his um, father-in-law's uh, cook, a conversation you have with his father-in-law's cook about her family, uh, her history and her family history in her time in New Bern, um, North Carolina. And the Chitlin Circuit one um, also seems like it's gonna be really good. Um, I think Donnie's going to try to include some music and some stories from Southport and um, it should be a really good time. So if you're interested, all you have to do is send uh, an email to info at Southport Historical Society and I'll send you all the Zoom links, all the information. You don't have to try to keep it straight. I'll just, I'll just send it to you. I've been